This is the BBC. For details of our complete range of programmes, go to bbcworldservice.com forward slash podcasts. Welcome to the latest global news compiled in the early hours of the morning on Tuesday the 2nd of January. I'm Alex Ritson with a selection of highlights from across BBC World Service News today. Coming up... As anti-government protests continued in Iran, a police officer has been shot dead in the central city of Najafabad by what the authorities describe as a rioter. Also in the podcast, a court in Israel has charged a 16-year-old Palestinian girl with assaulting an Israeli soldier after video footage of her slapping him drew widespread attention. Hundreds of high-profile women from the American TV and film industry have launched a campaign to tackle sexual abuse and harassment. And California has legalised the recreational use of cannabis. For me, this is really the culmination of my life's work to see the full legalization of cannabis in the world's sixth largest economy is a huge breakthrough. But first... A short excerpt from unverified material sent to the BBC purporting to show street protests in Iran. Police say one of their officers has been shot dead as anti-government protests continue across the country. A police spokesman said what he called a rioter, armed with a hunting rifle, had opened fire in the central city of Najafabad. This is believed to be the first death of a member of the security forces since the unrest began on Thursday. On Monday night, there were reports of more demonstrations in various cities, including the capital Tehran and Kerman Shah. At least 13 people have been killed during the five days of protests. Rana Rahimpur has been covering the protests for BBC Persian. I asked her about the reported death of a police officer. We are trying to find more details. It looks like it's actually in a township close to Najafabad, which is in the centre of Iran, and we have reports of very violent protests. Um, there have been some videos which we haven't been able to verify yet, but if they are true, there has been many gunshots. We can hear uh, many buildings being set on fire. Difficult to be sure that these are real, but if true, things are definitely extremely violent in that area right now. And if this is true, this is presumably likely to lead to a stepping up of the government reaction? It's not impossible, because until today they have tried to water it down. Today, one of the commanders of the Revolutionary Guard said that so far it hasn't been sig uh, significant enough for the Revolutionary Guards to get involved, and the rest of the police forces have been able to, to manage it. But uh, if this is confirmed, this would be the first security officer who has been killed in these protests, and I think that will definitely end up in more escalation of the tensions. Yes, just explain what it would mean if the Revolutionary Guards were deployed. There will definitely be more violence. Uh, it will be very similar to what happened in 2009 where many people were killed, beaten to death and many were put in prison. They were charged for many, many years, 10 years in prison. Some are still in prison, having been out since 2009. So fortunately, so far, the, the Iranian establishment has restrained itself from getting more violent, but it, is, it can es escalate. Rana Rahimpour from BBC Persian. President Trump has continued to tweet about events in Iran. Here's his most recent intervention. Iran is failing at every level, despite the terrible deal made with them by the Obama administration. The great Iranian people have been repressed for many years. They are hungry for food and freedom. Along with human rights, the wealth of Iran is being looted. Time for change, he said. James Kumarasamy has been discussing the American view of the protests with Suzanne Maloney, an Iran expert and senior fellow at the Brookings Center for Middle East Policy in Washington, D.C. What does she make of the way President Rouhani has been handling the demonstrations? I think what Rouhani wants to do is to assuage, at least in part, some sense of public indignation and frustration without necessarily um, giving some signal that the regime is in any way weakening in terms of its unwillingness to bend and to accommodate some of the demands of those on the streets. 
And five days in now, what, what's your assessment? There have been various interpretations of, of what's behind them. What's your sense now that we've had a few days to, to get the measure of it? Well, I think this is quite significant. And while we're still, I think, somewhat uncertain as to what precipitated it, it the protests certainly reflect long-standing grievances among the Iranian population about social freedoms, about political opportunities and, and representation, but especially around the economy. And so this is, I think, a boiling over of frustrations that were probably inflated, possibly unnecessarily or, or uh, in exaggerated fashion by Rouhani and others as they tried to sell the nuclear deal to their own domestic political elite. Iranians thought there was going to be a massive peace dividend and instead what they've seen is what many around the world have seen. The rich get richer and those on the bottom rungs of the ladder tend to fall further behind. Meanwhile, President Trump is saying it's time for change in Iran. He, he's tweeting. What sort of effect do you think his intervention has, if any? We have to put his tweets in context, which is to say that the president often engages in deliberate provocations through social media. But what he's reflecting, I think, is um, a consistent and broad interpretation among his administration, a determination to ratchet up pressure on Iran, and also a conviction that the problem is not the nuclear issue or Iran's specific regional adventurism, but the problem is the nature of the regime itself. And of course, we have heard from inside Iran some slogans which suggest that some of those out on the streets do see real issues with the regime. You know, death to the supreme leader. It's gone beyond the purely economic grievances, hasn't it? Yes, absolutely. It very quickly morphed into a direct confrontation with the Islamic Republic, with the system that has been in power since 1979. That's something quite different from prior incidents of uprising and upheaval within Iran. And I think to some extent what we see a bit of upping of the ante. Each time Iranians come to the streets, they test the possibilities, they often get pushed back. But the next time they come around, they tend to be more ambitious and more determined and uh, more absolutist in, in their demands. Suzanne Maloney, an Iran expert and senior fellow at the Brookings Center for Middle East Policy in Washington, D.C. A military court in Israel has charged a Palestinian teenager with assaulting two soldiers in her village in the West Bank. Ahed Tamimi and her cousin were filmed in a confrontation with the soldiers, during which she pushed and slapped one of them. Footage of the incident was widely circulated online. I found out more from our correspondent in Jerusalem, Yoland Nell. Well, in this video clip, you see two young women confronting two heavily armed Israeli soldiers. And one of them is telling uh, the soldiers repeatedly to leave. They're outside a house, it seems, in a yard. And then begins slapping the soldiers, pushing them, and later kicking them. And her cousin, as it turns out, joins in. The first woman that you see, really, your attention is drawn to, is Ahed Tamimi, this 16-year-old young woman who uh, is from Nabi Saleh in the West Bank. The video is being filmed by another Palestinian woman on her phone from inside the house. And this video clip really went viral on social media. And there have been two very starkly different interpretations of it. If you look on the Palestinian side, they've been portraying this young woman, Ahad Tamimi, as being really a hero. It's well known that her village, Nabi Saleh, is the scene of, of weekly protests. It's been the scene of regular clashes because locals hold these weekly protests over the loss of land and a local water spring to a nearby Israeli settlement. The Israeli interpretation of this video really led to calls for the arrest of Ahad Tamimi. There were lots of uh, discussions in the media of how it was very camera conscious, her confrontation. They called her Shirley Temper at one stage and were accusing her family, really abusing her as being a pawn, I suppose, to spread anti-Israeli sentiment. So how big an issue is this? Because the incident has even been labelled as, as fake on social media by 
Israelis. What's going on here? Well, certainly the Israeli interpretation is that this was a provocation of the two soldiers and there are compliments to the soldiers in question for not responding to the provocation, for reacting with restraint. But the family of Ahed Tamimi say that this takes place in the context of the, the soldiers entering the village not long after her 14-year-old cousin had been shot in the face by a rubber bullet. And there are pictures of him that were shared widely on social media and in the, the mainstream media as well as he had been put in a coma in hospital because of injuries to his face. And they say that she was uh, reacting to what had happened to her cousin and was trying to get the soldiers to leave. Um, but because of the way that there was another young woman inside the house uh, filming all of this and putting it out on social media, that's why it's, it's seen by the Israelis very much as being staged. Yoland Nell in Jerusalem. The Nigerian army says it's looking after more than 700 people who've escaped from the Islamist militant group Boko Haram. The hostages were being used as forced labourers. There's been no independent verification of the army's claims. Here's our Africa security correspondent, Tommy Aladipo. It's not known how long the people had been held by Boko Haram or if they all regained their freedom at the same time. The Nigerian army says that these villagers fled various islands in Lake Chad in the country's northeast and are currently safe in military custody. In a statement released today, an army spokesman implied that the people's freedom was the result of a joint operation by the Nigerian army and air force against Boko Haram last week. President Muhammadu Buhari said the Nigerian military had beaten the insurgents and that any ongoing attacks were isolated cases. It's not the first time he or his officials have made claims about Boko Haram's demise, but the insurgent attacks still continue, albeit with varying frequency in the form of suicide bombings and ambushes on military and aid convoys. Tommy Aladipo. The sixth biggest economy in the world legalized cannabis on Monday. California is issuing licenses for commercial sales, which mean millions of adults will have the chance to grow their own or set up a business. Opponents have long said the change in the law will introduce more young people to drugs and prompt a rise in driving while under the influence. Steve D'Angelo is a cannabis rights activist and advocate for cannabis reform in the United States. For me, this is really the culmination of my life's work to see the full legalization of cannabis in the world's sixth largest economy is a huge breakthrough. And I think that, that what it means is there's no going backwards from here. This is a global movement now. Many European countries have legalized medical cannabis. Canada and Uruguay, and now Paraguay, have legalized adult use cannabis. And it's now a, a unstoppable force. California is significant because of its economic might in, in the world, because it is the birthplace of brands that command global attention because it has ideal microclimates for growing cannabis, because we are proximate to Hollywood and to Silicon Valley. And between those two platforms, California really reaches the world. So it's a very strictly regulated system with a lot of consumer protection and safety requirements. So all of the cannabis in the legal system must be laboratory tested, both for potency and for safety. They can only be sold within the licensed system. So in order to grow or distribute or manufacture or retail a cannabis product, you have to have both a license from your municipality and from the state regulatory agency, the Bureau of Cannabis Control. The Bureau of Cannabis Control has the job of issuing licenses and regulating the new industry. So far, it's issued 400 licenses, which means that as of the 1st of January 2018, there will be 400 legal cannabis retailers in the state. So who are these new sellers? Alex Traverso is the Chief of Communications at the Bureau of Cannabis Control. The state's done a pretty good job of, of looking at what other states have, what their experiences have been, and trying to sort of scale it so we're going to have opportunities for small, medium, and large businesses to come in to the California market. We've seen a lot of different estimates. We've seen uh, estimates in the first, the first couple of years, the state could be bringing in up to a billion dollars in tax revenue from this new legalized cannabis industry. 
we're looking at every every license that we that we issue is is another little ding to the black market. When Proposition 64 passed in November of last year, there was 58 percent of the voters were in favor of it, and I think that. You know, again, with, with medical cannabis being legal in California for more than 20 years, I think that has become a part of a part of our state. And I think that we have so many state agencies that are involved in this. I think we all feel pretty good about where we are. And I think we know that if there are things that don't go according to plan, that there will be plenty of ways that we can um, look into fixing those things. Alex Traverso, Chief of Communications at the Bureau of Cannabis Control in California. I spoke to Jessica Flores from KPIX 5 News, who is in Oakland on the east side of San Francisco Bay. People have been lining up outside the doors of Harborside Dispensary here in Oakland since 4 a.m. At the moment, it's 11.19 a.m. here, and the line is still long. So people have been waiting for this day for quite some time since Proposition 64 passed in 2016. They're ringing in the new year, purchasing recreational marijuana. All they need to show is that they're 21 or older, and they need cash or debit card to buy, because remember, this is still federally illegal in the United States, so you cannot use a credit card here. And I can tell you that folks have been out here. It's like a celebration. They have their party hats on. There's balloons. There's free giveaways. This is not Black Friday, but they're calling it Green Monday. And that's certainly the feeling out here as people try to get their hands on weed before the prices are expected to go up. Opponents, though, fear that this sends a message to young people that it's okay to use drugs. That is the big concern from a lot of uh, public health advocates. They worry that, you know, there's sweeteners in uh, some of these marijuana products, that they have uh, gummy bears, things like that. that will attract kids and so there are some public health campaigns to warn children of you know the dangers of smoking similar to what you would see with tobacco anti-tobacco campaigns but public health advocates say it's not enough and that's why they're worried about this rollout that this is going to attract a younger generation to smoking marijuana what's the idea of this is this just taking taking the trade away from the illegal market from the criminals that's what advocates would say that you are taking uh, the sales away from the cartels which have been huge in California and that you're making this you know mainstream bringing it to light and uh, you know this place I, I'm in right now this dispensary Harborside in Oakland it actually was raided uh, by the federal government when it first opened so they've been kind of operating you know illegally when it comes to the federal federal government rules but now that it's legal in California they think you know they have lawmakers in California on their side and they're able to operate in a whole new way here and so they're excited about you know the booming business here in California but there's still a lot of questions about what this means in the state going forward. How will uh, law enforcement regulate uh, folks who may be too high to drive? And what this means also, of course, for public health and secondhand smoke. Jessica Flores from KPIX 5 News in Oakland, California. You're listening to Global News, the most important stories and the best interviews and on-the-spot reporting from the BBC World Service. And don't forget, there are lots of other podcast series from the BBC World Service. And there's one place to go and find out what's new and to discover the very best of podcasts to listen to, our newsletter. And it couldn't be easier to get it. Search online for BBC World Service Newsletter or go to bbcworldservice.com slash newsletter. Sign up and the newsletter with its fantastic podcast recommendations will be sent straight to your inbox. And don't forget our brand new podcast series, The Assassination with Owen Bennett-Jones. I can actually say... It is one of the most extraordinary podcasts I have ever heard, and I don't say that lightly. Back to this podcast, and more than 300 leading actresses, female filmmakers and other entertainment executives have unveiled an initiative to tackle pervasive sexual harassment in Hollywood and working-class jobs across the United States. Called Time's Up, it includes a legal defence fund that has so far raised more than $13 million to provide subsidised legal support to women and men who were sexually harassed, assaulted or abused in the workplace. Peter Bowes reports from Los Angeles. The Time's Up movement includes the actresses Kate Blanchett, Ashley Judd, Natalie Portman and Meryl Streep. It was formed after the deluge of allegations last year that disrupted or ended the careers of several prominent and influential men in the entertainment business. 
It started with the scandal surrounding Harvey Weinstein, but also included leading figures in business, politics and the media. The initiative focuses on raising money to help people in low-wage jobs such as agriculture workers, cleaners and waitresses. In an open letter, the group says, harassment too often persists because perpetrators and employers never face any consequences. It urges the media to turn the spotlight on abuses in what it describes as less glamorised trades. It also calls on women to wear black at the Golden Globe Awards next Sunday as a statement against gender and racial inequality. Peter Bowes in Los Angeles. October the 1st, 2017 is a day that will stay in the memory of many people around the world and most definitely those who are in the thick of what happened in Las Vegas. A gunman opened fire from a hotel bedroom on a large crowd enjoying a music festival below. He killed 58 people and injured more than 500. Rock music fans will also remember that a few hours later the musician Tom Petty died, a news item that might have received more prominent coverage had it not been buried by the horror of what happened in Las Vegas. Patterson Hood is a rock singer and writer and a member of the southern rock band Drive-By Truckers. In the past, he's written about America's gun culture and the number of lives that have been wasted. He was also a massive fan of Tom Petty. He's been reflecting with Razia Iqbal about that day. It was a crazy, intense day. Um, ironically, we were in the studio that day. We were we were mixing our new single that was uh, that was written in the wake of another tragic day because it was written in the wake of the uh, violence in Charlottesville, Virginia this summer. And so I had written a song about that and we were in the studio mixing that song and um, I woke up that morning to the news of what had happened in Las Vegas and we were all kind of in a shock and pretty devastated as we were doing our work. Dumb, white and angry with their cup half filled Running over people down in Charlotte a couple of hours into our work, we uh, received word about Tom Petty, and that did it. Hit was very close to us. I mean, the first band I ever had as a as a young boy when I was 14 years old was called Breakdown after a Tom Petty song. So I've literally been a fan of his music since his very first record. And uh, and we had the honor of getting to tour with Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers. In 2010, we did a tour opening for them. So, you know, it hit on many levels. What are your thoughts then about, if you like, the bigger event, however close and however ardent and a fan of Tom Petty's you are, and, and tragic though that day was for him and his family, the fact that as many people were killed in the way that they were, in the context of you being a, a you know a rock star who deals with politics and issues that are to do with society, I, I wonder what your reflections were then about that specifically. I, I can't even really wrap my head around it, you know. And I mean, as still. a writer, my job, yeah, still as a writer, my job is to wrap my head around things that are sometimes, you know, unthinkable. And I can't, I'm failing at it. I can't do it. You know, it, it's such a widespread problem right now in our, in our country that uh, there was another massive shooting, you know, in that church in Texas. And, uh, you know, there's a song on our, our last album called Guns of Umqua that was written about a shooting that, that happened at a small college up here in the Northwest, up in uh, at Umqua Community College, about three hours south of Portland, Oregon. And uh, I wrote a song about that on the last record. We're all standing in the shadows of our noblest intentions of something more than being shot in the classroom in Oregon. That was my attempt of trying to wrap my head around something like that. And that was a much smaller sized act of violence than what we're talking about in, in Las Vegas. And I'm so frustrated you know, at our society. I'm frustrated at our government for refusing to even attempt to take any kind of an action and throwing up their hands saying, well, it's hopeless. This is just the, the price of, didn't one of our politicians, I think, said that it was the price of our freedom. And uh, I can't fathom that line of thinking either. The rock singer Patterson Hood.
The outcome of the elections in Catalonia in December further complicated the political crisis following moves there towards independence from Spain. Now the Spanish economy minister has put the financial cost of the affair at around $1.2 billion. Louis de Guindos says there was a significant slowdown in the Catalan economy after October's unauthorised independence referendum. I asked our Europe editor, Mike Sanders, if the minister explained how he arrived at that figure. Well, he's basing it on the growth figures for Catalonia in the fourth quarter, which he said were down from 0.9% year-on-year to 0.4% year-on-year. So a significant slump, you would think, there. Madrid, of course, has been talking up the economic problems as part of its political manoeuvring to try and get Catalan voters to vote for parties that want to keep Catalonia in Spain. And this was one of the, the major planks of their election campaign for the elections last month. Madrid has al- had already lowered the national growth forecast from 26 to 2.3% because of what's happening in Catalonia. But conversely, the European Commission which is rather notorious for over-optimistic figures, it actually raised its growth forecast for for Spain for 2018 to 2.5% in mid-November, which was obviously in the midst of the crisis. So somebody perhaps is... There's a bit of a disparity there. Historically, Catalonia has been the economic engine of the Spanish economy. That's going to continue, isn't it? Absolutely. It remains so. One in four cars produced in Spain are produced in uh, Catalonia. You've got the big Seat works there. You've got a Nissan works there. It produces about 15 billion euros turnover annually. That's a little bit more in in dollars. And it's 12% of Spain's industrial production, the the car industry alone. 20%, in fact... Of Spanish GDP is is produced in Catalonia, and despite the problems, that's likely continu- to continue. There are major problems, nevertheless. Car sales are down, and tourism is down significantly. Fifteen percent drop in bookings after the violence on the day of the referendum, the independence referendum on October the first, when. There were pictures beamed across the world of police forcibly stopping people from voting, and that played very badly. Briefly, though, further confrontation likely between Madrid and Catalonia? Well, the big problem is that the election result was very inconclusive. The Ciudadanos was the... the that's a pro-unionist party, if you like. That was the biggest pa- single party in the election. But uh, together, the separatist bloc stands the best chance of forming an administration. So the election really hasn't sold very little. Our Europe editor, Mike Sanders. The UK's recycling industry has warned that it may not be able to cope with a Chinese ban on most imports of plastic waste. Britain has been shipping half a million tonnes of plastic to China every year. But from now on, China will refuse to deal with the waste as part of a move to upgrade its industries. Our environment analyst Roger Harabin has more details. More than a quarter of the UK's waste plastic has typically been shipped to China for recycling. But China wants to upgrade its industries, so it's banning imports of Western waste. Other Asian nations will reprocess some of the UK's plastic rubbish. But Britain's recycling industry has told BBC News it doesn't know how it'll cope with what's left over. The UK Recycling Association described the Chinese move as a huge blow. The local government association said some of the impending waste plastic mountain could be burned in incinerators, but this idea will be fought by green groups. The government's looking at taxes and deposit schemes to deter plastic waste, but that's for the long term. No one seems to know yet how Britain will solve its short-term China crisis. Roger Harabin. Thousands of people, it seems, are determined to save an authentic slice of Anglo-Indian history in central London. It's the India Club, established in the 1950s and offering budget accommodation, a canteen restaurant and a bar. It was set up as a place to foster Indian-British friendship and from the decor has hardly changed. But there are now plans for a boutique hotel on the site. This month, Historic England will consider a petition and make a decision on whether to declare the club a listed building, which means it would be preserved as it is. Fahana Darwood reports. The India Club sits on the Strand, a busy part of central London. Trafalgar Square is five minutes down the road. The India Club sits opposite what used to be the BBC World Service's home at Bush House. The Indian High Commission is around the corner and the Royal Courts of Justice can be seen around 300 metres away. 
Climbing the stairs is like stepping back to the 1950s. Up some more stairs is the restaurant. I had sort of a lamb boona with coconut rice and some dal and mango lassi. I think this place is authentic and has history. So I think it, that's why I think it's quite sad that um, most of the developers want to put hotels because tourists come to London to see things that are authentic and have been have more historical aspect and Americans love that. So if you take that away, what's going to be left in London? Hi. Hi. Hi can I have a quick word? So you're cleaning the tables here. My name is Rupon. India Club, so far I know, is very old historical place and this place we got so many customers coming from different parts of the UK, even different parts of the world. They have so many memories in this building and when customers come, they get amazed how you retain everything same like we, we have seen 30 years ago, somebody say 40 years ago, someone brings their grandchildren as well here and food quality is kind of, they feel like they're sitting in India in some restaurant. I come from time to time when I'm in this part of London. It's great, there's nowhere else like it in London, absolutely nowhere. It's just brilliant. How long have you been coming here? Oh, about 25 years. And it hasn't changed at all. It's the same cutlery, it's the same table, same liner on the stairs. It's great, and the food's good. It's incredibly inexpensive. It's full of atmosphere. I love it. It'd be a terrible shame. Yeah, it'd be a great shame if the developers were allowed to get rid of it. I think it'd be a disaster. It's, it's really a distinctive corner of London. This is more like some of the restaurants and places that you go to in India than most Indian restaurants. And it was set up by Nehru. I mean, this is extraordinary. And Menon, who was the first ambassador to Britain, it really is a historic place. And it's, and it's a sort of period piece. For the last 25 years, I've never ever seen the menu. I did not even know what's on, on the menu. Honestly. Which is true, because the chef is very good. And he's kind of like nearly good as my Sikh wife. I order from our card menu. So I will have to send you by email. I am I Yadgar Marker, and uh, I am the proprietor of this place. The problem we have at the moment is that um, there is a threat, in fact, of the place being converted to a boutique hotel. So a planning application has been put through by the freeholders uh, to uh, Westminster City Council. So we have appealed to Historic England to have the place listed. At the same time, we've lodged uh, an objection with Westminster City Council. My name is Faroza Marker and um, I'm the manager at India Club. Um, yes. That would ultimately mean an end to India Club itself because the plans which are submitted show ensuite hotel bedrooms on every floor. It's not just the upper floors which are already a hotel, it's on the floor which has the restaurant and the floor which has the lounge and bar as well would be a modern hotel. And it, it's just removing that whole history of the place. We'd be losing what really makes London special and unique. Feroza Marka ending that report from Fahana Dawood. And I remember the India Club from our Bush House days. It certainly gave the staff canteen at BBC Bush House a run for its money. That's all from us for now, but an updated version of the Global News podcast will be available for you to download later. If you want to comment on this podcast or the topics covered in it, you can send us an email. The address is globalpodcast at bbc.co.uk. I'm Alex Ritson. Until next time, goodbye.